Fantastic. Thank you, musicians. And uh, let me add my welcome to you as well this evening. It's great to see you. Um, what we're going to do for about the next hour and a half is... <laughs> sorry. Um, for the next 20 minutes is we're going to do what we do every Sunday, actually. It's just um, over these last few weeks, we've been taking a different big question um, each Sunday evening and, and trying to just look at it briefly together. And so tonight we're going to look at the next one. And uh, tonight we're looking at this question. How can we know which religion is correct? Uh, we've heard tonight the story, Adam's story, of how he came to know Jesus. He was brought up in a Christian family. He heard about Jesus. He's become a Christian and he follows Jesus today. But you might think, well, if Adam was born in a different part of the world or was born to different parents, maybe he wouldn't be a Christian. So why should we think that he's picked the right way? And why should I be inclined to follow it as well, particularly if your background isn't a Christian one? So this is a really big question that we can ask. It's a particularly big question in our culture today. I mean, there are some parts of the world where people wouldn't necessarily ask this question because they're really only exposed to one religion and they assume theirs is correct. Um, or in a previous generation where in Britain most people would have regarded themselves as Christian and wouldn't have necessarily thought about any others. But actually our society and our generation is different, isn't it? Um, you just need to walk down the street and you realize that we're in a multicultural society. I grew up in Leicester and in Leicester within a few minutes walk of my house you could go to a church, you could go to a synagogue, you could go to a mosque, you could go to a Buddhist temple, you could go to a Sikh temple, and you used to be able to go to a Hare Krishna temple, but that one blew up in a gas leak. Um, they did, they did, I was just trying to find the Hare Krishna building, and that was the only one I could find. Sorry, they did rebuild it, but they haven't taken a photograph of the new one. So, so actually, we live in a society where we're confronted with different religious views. Why should we think that Christianity is unique or superior? Um, uh, BBC ran a series a while back called Around the World in 80 Faiths, looking at 80 of the different faiths around our world, just showing us that we're not alone in this world. There are so many different worldviews, philosophies, and ideas. And how do we know which one's right? And why should we think that Christianity is worth following, if at all? Well, I don't know about you. I guess some of you might be sitting here thinking, well, this is just confusing. It's just pick and mix. How would I ever make up my mind if there are so many different religions on offer? And maybe for some of us, we might think, well, because it's so confusing, I'm not even going to bother try. You know, why, why is this important? You know, some people do religion, but, I, but I'm not really into that. But actually, I would say this is really important because the matters at stake here are matters of life, death, and eternity. And um, to quote the great Liverpool manager Bill Shankly, he said, football's not a matter, uh, sorry, they say, some people say that football is a matter of life and death, it's more important than that. But this is a matter of life and death, and even more important. So these questions about life and eternity are worth looking at. So where do we start, though, when we think about religion? Well, some people say, aren't all religions basically the same? My RE teacher uh, loved to tell the story about the elephants. Have you heard this one? Um, you've got the blind men all feeding the elephants, trying to work out what it is. And one feels its side and thinks it's a brick wall. Another feels its leg and thinks it's a tree trunk. Another feels its tail and thinks it's a rope. And we'll stop with the body parts there. But, um, but they're all feeling. And, and the illustration is given, you know, the person giving the illustration says, basically, that's what religions are like. They're grasping at God and about reality. And they're all coming to different conclusions. They're all just grasping different parts of that reality. Now, there's a few problems with the illustration. Um, first problem is, it's actually a very arrogant illustration. You see, who is it in the illustration that claims to be able to understand and see? It's the person giving it. So the person giving the illustration is saying, I can see what no other religious leader, what no other philosopher has ever been able to see. I have seen it. I've got the answers, which for someone trying to be quite humble is actually quite arrogant. But the other problem is this, and it's a fundamental one. They weren't all right, were they? They were all wrong. It wasn't a tree or a rope at all. It was an elephant. They got the complete wrong end of the stick or the animal, okay? And to say that all religions are the same, well, that's just not true, is it? You don't need to have a PhD in world religions to know that they believe very different things. Some believe in God, some don't. And they believe very different things about God and how to get to God. They're not all grasping the same reality. So I don't think that really works. Some people say, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. 
But I think 9-11 taught us that that's not the case, is it? Actually, beliefs influence behavior. And we want to say some beliefs can be dangerous. So actually, belief is important. And what you believe is important as well. Well, some people say, isn't it exclusive, though, to say that only one might be right? Shouldn't we say that all of them, or at least some of them, are right? It's exclusive to say that your way is right and others are wrong. Well, it's interesting to say that, because if you say that, it's worth just thinking through that actually every view about religion is ultimately exclusive. Some of you heard this before, but there are basically four views that you might have about religion. You might think that they're all right, they're all true. You might say that, well, only some of them are true. We'll kind of dismiss a few of the wacky ones. Or maybe you'll say, no, only one religion is true. And it's not just Christians that say that. Um, Muslims uh, would say that too. This is on the uh, wall just next to the Church of the Nativity in Nazareth. Uh, I took a picture of it when I was there. And it says, whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And in the hereafter, he will be one of the losers. Which I thought was rather interesting that you're eternally one of the losers if you're not one of them. So there are people who say, no, only one religion is right. And other people, of course, say, well, no religions are right. Someone like Richard Dawkins, an atheist, says they're all completely wrong. Now, you might think that only option three is exclusive out of those, but actually, all of them are. I mean, think about it. If you think that all religions are right, then you think that the people who say that some of them, one of them, and none of them are right, are wrong. If you say that, okay, only some of the religions are right, you're actually saying that the people who say that all of them, one of them, or none of them are right, are wrong, and so on, and so on, and so on. Basically, whatever you think about religion, whether you think they're all right, none of them are right, or whatever, you're going to disagree with someone else. So get over this fact that look, everyone's right. You can't have beliefs about reality and not disagree with someone else. You can't live on planet Earth and do that. You're going to disagree with someone somewhere along the line. So stop saying Christianity is exclusive. Every belief is exclusive. And if you say, well, you don't have beliefs, of course we all have beliefs. Everyone has beliefs. So how can we know which one is correct? Well, of course, one option is you could just investigate them all in detail. Uh, enroll in a course in comparative religions and spend weeks and weeks studying the different religious systems of the world. You could do that, and actually I've got nothing to say against that. Christianity doesn't say, you know, don't look at other religions, you might find something better. I'm quite confident that you can look at other religions and you won't find anything better. We'll come to that in a moment. But there's a problem with that. The BBC series shows us that there are a lot of religions, a lot of beliefs. How long is it going to take you to understand all the beliefs of the world to a degree well enough that you could make a decision which one is best? Or there's something else you could do. You could start with Christianity. Now, some of you are thinking, well, of course you're going to say that, aren't you? You're a Christian and we're in church. You're bound to say I should start with Christianity. Well, of course I would. But, actually, I think there's another reason why you should start your claim, your, your search with Christianity, and it's this. The claims that Christianity make are quantifiably different and bigger than the claims of any other religion or philosophy of the world. So much so that if Christianity is true, then it is head and shoulders above any of the other claims that have been made. So if you discover Christianity is true, you don't need to keep searching because you found the greatest claim of all. If it's not true, then by all means, keep searching. So I just want to look at two reasons why I think Christianity in particular, and Jesus in particular, is the way to go. Firstly, Christianity can be shown to be true in a way that other religions can't. Christianity can be shown to be true in a way that other religions can't. You see, you say, how do you know Christianity is true? Well, that's a very good question, isn't it? Here's a more fundamental question. How do you know whether anything is true? I mean, how can you know whether a claim is true or not? Let me give you two examples. Num example number one. I believe that there are fairies that live in my bike shed. Okay? They're invisible fairies 
that cannot be sensed by any human sense, but I believe they live there. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Now, how do you know whether my belief is true? It's very difficult, isn't it? It's hard to say it's not true because there's no means by which you could show it wasn't because they're invisible and you can't sense them. So whatever you say, I'll just say, well, you know, they're there, you just can't see them. So it's hard to show whether that belief's true or false. You just have to say, well, you know, that's nice for you, Michael, and the rest of us will carry on living our lives. But what about this? I believe that my mum is the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Well, that's kind of easy to show that it's not true, isn't it? There's kind of quantifiable evidence you can check out. You can show that someone else is the Prime Minister of Great Britain, and no matter how much I would like my mum to be the Prime Minister, she's not, okay? It's different. So there are some things that you can show to be true or false, and there are some things you can't. Now, those are two silly illustrations, but let me just take this a bit further. How do you know which religion is true? Take Buddhism, for instance. How do you know whether Buddhism is true? Well, it's quite hard, isn't it? I mean, Buddha lived, but that doesn't necessarily make Buddhism true. And you can look at the teachings of Buddhism, but how do you know it's true? You, know, you might say, I like it, or I don't like it. It works for me, or it doesn't work for me. But how do you know it's true? Well, it's very hard to say, because it's just a system of teachings. It's a philosophy. It's not based on anything objective. It's a subjective reaction you can have. You say, I like it or don't. Or Islam, for instance. How can you say, is Islam true? Again, it's very difficult, isn't it? The center of the claim of Islam is that Muhammad went into a cave, received the words of God, Allah, and wrote them down. But how do we know that that happened? No one else was in the cave. There's nothing else to base it on other than saying, I believe it was true or I don't. But you see, it's not objective. You can't falsify it, to use a technical term. And because you can't falsify it, because there's no way that you could show it wasn't true, it's very hard to show that it is true. It is, you might just say, a matter of blind faith. You accept it or not. And that's the problem with just about every religion. To show whether it's true or not is very difficult. And so people end up being quite subjective. I like this one, I don't like this one. I like this bit, but I don't like that bit. But with Christianity, I would suggest it's different. Because Christianity is, I would say, falsifiable. It makes a claim that you can investigate. Let me try and explain. Christianity is all about Jesus Christ. You're going to get that from the name, don't you? It's really in the name. Uh, as someone said, you know, if you take Christ out of Christian, you're just left with three letters, I-A-N and Ian can't help you. Because it's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus and because it's all about Jesus, Christianity isn't just a system of teaching. It is based on a person, but not just any old person, but the claim that this person was God. And not just on what he said, but also on what he did. The signs, the miracles that would back up his claims and his teaching. And the biggest miracle and the biggest claim of all, the resurrection. Now, did that happen? Well, when it comes to that claim, we're in a different kind of field. Because the resurrection didn't just happen in a corner. It was a public event. People saw the resurrected Jesus. There was an empty tomb. There was evidence that people could investigate. And there's evidence that we can investigate too. See, here's the difference. Is Christianity true? That is a question you can answer because the investigation is different. There's evidence you can look into. You can answer that question in a different way to you can say Islam, Buddhism, or anything else. And when people have investigated it, what they've discovered is, it's true. They've discovered that the evidence points towards the fact that the central claim of Christianity, that Jesus lived, died, and rose again, is real and true. Let me just give you two people who said that. You may not have heard of Sir Lionel Luckhu. He's in the Guinness Book of Records as the most successful lawyer in history. I think in one uh, run, he managed to successfully defend 248 cases um, in a row, uh, which is pretty successful. He was so successful that the Simpsons uh, invented a character called Lionel Hutz. Um, rather ironically, uh, the Simpsons character never won a case, um, unlike the real-life Sir Lionel, who never lost a case. But Sir Lionel Luck, who was an incredible lawyer, he was used to looking into evidence. He was also a Christian, and this is what he concluded. 
He said, I say unequivocally, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubts. He says, it's convincing. Or or listen to another knight, Sir Edward Clarke, another lawyer. As a lawyer, I have made a prolonged study of the evidence for the events of the first Easter day, resurrection. To me, the evidence is conclusive. And over and over again in the high courts, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. He said, look, if you look into the evidence, if you investigate it, you can know that Christianity is true. It's not a matter of simply blind faith or personal choice or taste. It's true. So are you willing to investigate it? Because if you are, you can find that too. We can know it's true. So that's the first reason why I think Christianity is correct. Because you can investigate it and show it to be true in a way you can't with others. But secondly and briefly, why is Christianity true because it offers a solution to our greatest needs that other religions cannot do. See, some people say, well, as a Christian, do you think that all religions are wrong? And I say, well, no, not on everything. Of course not. There are things that other religions say that I think are true. Other religions say that murder is wrong, and I agree. So there are things that I agree on. Although what I would say is I don't think there's anything that any other religion teaches that is true that you won't find also in the Bible. But what you will also find in the Bible, I would suggest, is this. A solution to man's greatest needs that no other religion scratches the surface on. See, most of us basically think religion boils down to one of three things. It's either a system of thinking, feeling, or doing. It's about what you think. It's a system of teaching. It's about an experience that you have of God or a certain behavior practice that you need to to adopt. And we think, well, surely Christianity is just another way of thinking, another way of doing, another set of doctrines. And why should your behavior be better than my behavior? But what the Bible shows us is that fundamentally Christianity is not just about a different way of thinking or feeling or doing, but it's actually a different way of being. Because our fundamental problem is not an intellectual one, It's not an emotional one, but it's one at the very core of who we are. Jesus once met a highly religious man called Nicodemus, a man who had worked hard at thinking the right things about God, had worked hard at doing the right things to try and be accepted by God, who had worked hard at having experiences of God. And yet Jesus said to this man, unless you're born again, you won't even know what this is all about. You'll never know God. Now that phrase, born again, sounds rather religious, doesn't it? What does it mean to be born again? Well, let me try and explain. Imagine I want to play for the England football team. And I conclude that uh, you know, after England have beaten Italy tonight, they're going to need some help against Germany uh, midweek. And so I offer my services to Roy Hodgson. And I say to Roy, um, I think I am your answer. Rooney's a bit off form. Uh, he's a bit rusty. Uh, but I think I'm your answer. And so I think you should pick me uh, against Germany. And so Roy says, well, why don't you come over to um, to Poland and we'll uh, put you through your paces at the training camp. So I uh, get on the flight tomorrow, head over, and Roy says, okay, let's see what you're made of. So I put on my boots, get into my kit, and start running around on the pitch. And, uh, well, it's a bit atrocious. You know, I, I slice the ball so wide it hits the corner flag. I miss the ball completely with the header and my volley goes well over the bar for three points. And at the end of about three minutes of this, Roy calls me over and he says, Michael, thank you so much for flying out here. But I just want you to know that the only hope that you really have of playing for England is if you're born again. Now, what is he saying? Is he saying, Michael, you're pretty good. You've got some natural talent and some flair, but but you're just a bit kind of weak on a few areas. And if you go away and train hard over the summer, you might be able to, you know, join in the World Cup qualifiers. He's not saying that, is he? He's saying, Michael, you're too old. You're too unfit. You've got too left foot and no coordination. You need a miracle. You need to start your life all over again as one who might just have some ability as a footballer. He's saying you need to be born again. And Jesus says what we need is to be born again. Not just to kind of tack a bit of religion onto our lives. Not just to try a bit harder to be morally superior. But to have a completely new start. And that's what Jesus came to bring. 
a completely new start. What does it look like? He says, firstly, you need to have forgiveness for the past. Jesus said, look, no matter what you do in the future, won't make up for the past. You need that dealt with, and I've come to deal with it for you. It's not about what you do, but it's what I've done for you that really matters. And I gave my life for you. I died on a cross so you could be forgiven. So you could have the past wiped clean. No other religion offers you that, but Jesus will give you forgiveness and a clean slate. But he'll also give you power for the presence. See, religion will teach you how to live, but it won't give you the power to live that way. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit to change you from the inside out. So that you can live the way you know you should live. So that you can become the person you were created to be. I won't simply tell you how to live. I will help you to live that way. I'll give you the power for the present. And I'll give you real hope for the future. Not simply that you might be reincarnated as something good. Or might go off to some fluffy heaven. But the real hope of resurrection. The hope that these bodies will one day be redeemed and set free. The hope that this world will be transformed and made new. Only Jesus offers that. Only Jesus deals with our past. Only Jesus deals with, gives us the power to live in the present. Only Jesus gives us real hope for the future. Only Jesus. And is that exclusive? But in one sense it is, isn't it? It is only Jesus. But actually, it's not exclusive because it's for everyone. Jesus said... This isn't just for people who live in a part of the world or get brought up in certain families. Or This is for everyone. Whoever you are, whatever you are upbringing, this is for you. Jesus is for you. And the only thing that will exclude you would be yourself. If you choose to say, no, I don't want him. And I'm going to go my own way. But why would you want to do that? when you've got someone like Jesus? Why would you reject someone like this? So I plead with you and encourage you tonight, don't reject him. Come to him, trust him like Adam did. And find that forgiveness, find that power, find that hope, find that truth. Find Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can know that what we believe is true because it really happens. But it's not just true, it's so wonderfully good news. Thank you that you are willing to forgive the past. Thank you that you give us hope for the future and the power to live differently now. And for those who don't yet know Jesus, I really pray that you would help them to receive and trust in him to find him, to follow him. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before we sing to finish, let me just encourage you, um, before you dash off um, to go and get a cup of tea or whatever else you might want to do, um, I know there are other things you might be thinking about, but can I say again, this is really important. And I'd love you to, to look into this more. This is a matter, not just of life and death, but of eternity too. And one of the best ways to look into it would be just to, to look into Jesus for yourself. And so down on the piano seat down there, I've just put some copies of John's Gospel. And I'd love you to take one of these away and in your own time, just read for yourself about Jesus and say, well, if this is true, what does it mean? What's it about? And what difference will it make for me? Come and take one of these. And if you've got questions, um, do come and chat to me as well. And do come back. Um, any Sunday, you're very welcome. And we'll be continuing this series um, next Sunday evening as well.